All right. Now, uh, thank you so much for coming today. I know we're, we're in a new uh, location and everyone still came out. We had b- big numbers in the first service too, so thank you for coming. Um, do you want to know what we got bumped out of the ballroom for? Yeah. Found out this week. Um, we got bumped out for a pinball machine convention. <laughs> so at least it was like a really retro and cool like reason for getting bumped out and um, you know, maybe you can swing past the ballroom on the way home and you know, play some pinball. Um, but let's, uh, let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Lord, we do pray as we just sung that you would open our eyes and help us to see Jesus and help us to open our ears that we may listen. And so, Lord, speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me ask you guys, young people, how do you feel about family reunions? Um, maybe some of you love them. You can't wait to go and see all your cousins and long lost aunties and uncles. Maybe some of you today dread family reunions. Maybe at family reunions, you get those intrusive questions, you know, like when are you going to get married? <laughs> when are you going to have kids? Have you gained a little bit of weight? You know, those kind of intrusive questions that we have from people that we barely know. Or maybe, maybe your experience is like this. Oh my goodness, you've grown. I remember when you were a baby. Come give me a hug. I don't even know this woman, you know. <laughs> Family reunions can be kind of a unique experience, but they can also be quite powerful too. I remember coming home from overseas and having my my little daughter have this poster, Welcome Home Daddy. Uh, Or you think about all the COVID reunions that are happening now, these emotional reunions of family coming back together in the airport. Uh, Over in Sudan, over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of civil war, a lot of things happening in Sudan, a lot of families being split apart in a, in a time like that. And this is um, a project that UNICEF went about uh, to reunite families. And this is Angela. She's 15 years old and she thought her mum had died in a rage. She didn't see her for two years and UNICEF brought them back together. And there's this powerful reunion. So Family reunions can be so powerful. But the one that gets me in the feels every time, I don't know if you've seen these viral videos on, on social media of the army dads. You know when the army dads, they've been away for like 12 months or two years or something and they come back but they don't tell the kids. And so they come up and they set up this kind of scene and this is one of them where you probably saw this one, you might have seen it. If you haven't, got to go see it where they put a blindfold on the kid and the dad came home and it was another person with the boxing gloves like playing and mucking around with them and then they swapped and the dad came in and they're playing this little boxing game and then all of a sudden he speaks to his son and his son just stops in his track and goes, Daddy? Like that and then takes off the blindfold and oh my goodness, they just embrace and every time I watch that, I just, I I bawl. bawl. Like I can't watch that without bawling. It's like such an emotional Family reunion. And so family reunions, yes, they can be awkward, but they can also be particularly powerful. And that's that's actually what you see happen. What Emily just read out for us in Exodus 18. This is a family reunion. Now, we see this up Moses and his wife, Zipporah, and his two sons, Gershon and Eliezer, they come back together, but also Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. And that's what most of the text centers around, this reunion between Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro. Now, the last time they were together was earlier in the book of Exodus. If you've been with with, with us, you might remember that. Uh, The last time it was Moses had just met with God at the burning bush. And so he'd received this commission by God to go back to Egypt and deliver the people. He's 80 years old. He's been out in the desert for 40 years. He's been living with Jethro and and living as a family man and the whole deal. But God calls him to go back to Egypt. And so on the way, he goes back to his father-in-law, Jethro, seeks his blessing. They part ways. And that's the last that we heard of Jethro. But a lot has happened since, right? A lot has happened since. And verse 1 tells us that Jethro had heard all the things that God had done for Moses and for Israel. So I kind of see Jethro as kind of like this proud dad figure who you know, cuts out the newspaper clippings of, of his son's victories. And so you can imagine he's hearing all this information like, do you hear what happened in Egypt? Do you hear like, you know, how the plagues have come and how you know, the Passover happened and how the, the Red Sea split and they walked through on dry land. And, and then on the other side, I had this incredible victory of Amalek- of, over the Amalekites. And so Jethro is hearing all these things. And so now, of course, when the dust has settled 
and, you know, the, the war is over and this kind of, you know, normal kind of life in Israel is taking place, Jethro sees it as an opportunity to come back and have this reunion with Moses. But not only that, Moses' wife and his two sons are with Jethro, and so Jethro is going to bring them back together. It's going to be this emotional family reunion. But notice what's missing in the text is that there's no detail about Moses having this reunion with his wife and his two sons. I know that's what I'd, I'd be focusing on, is about coming to see my wife and my, my, my children. But actually, all of the detail is around Jethro, his father-in-law, and Moses. And the reason for that is this is not a typical family reunion. This, is, this reunion is a little bit different. And the clue for that is in verse 1, where Jethro is titled as the priest of Midian. He's called the priest of Midian. And so what we see here is Jethro and Moses, they're family, but they're not spiritual family. They're in a different spiritual family. Now, to explain this, you've got to think about the the people group. The Midianites, they were from the same uh, descendant as the Israelites. They both had the same father, but they had a different mother. And so the Midianites were a different people group, and they were known for the worship of different gods. So they had a god for everything. They had a god for the sun, for the moon, for water, for childbearing, for love, for hate, for all different kinds of things. There were different gods. And so the Midianites were caught up in the worship of all different tribal deities. And that's very different to Israel, because Israel were known for believing in the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who revealed his personal name as Yahweh. And so they believed in one God. And so it's a little bit hard to tell what Jethro was caught up in, but he was a priest of Midian. A priest is somebody who serves the people and God, you know, serves as like an intermediary intermediary between people and God. And so, you know, it seems likely that Jethro was kind of open to this kind of polytheism, the worship of different gods. Sure, he had an appreciation for Yahweh. He recognized Yahweh as Israel's God, but perhaps he was also open to multiple deities in the region. Now, it all sounds a little bit weird, right? Ancient gods, tribal deities, how, what's, how is that related to us in our time? But maybe Jethro's kind of belief system isn't that different to people that you might meet today. You see, ex- um, spirituality today is dominated by the belief that, you know, pretty much religion is all the same. And in the end, religion all kind of leads up the same mountain. I I remember a couple of years ago, I was in New Zealand and we climbed up this mountain called Mount Monganui. And there was two ways that you could go up. You could go round and round and round the mountain, like the scenic route, or you could take the steep incline to the top of the mountain. They both kind of arrived at the same place, But they had different roots. And that's the way a lot of people see religion is that, you know, all paths lead to God. In the end, you all kind of end up in the same place. That's a really popular position to hold. And the reason it's popular is because, you know, it's the least threatening and it's the most accommodating. And, you know, it sort of allows everyone to just sort of do what they want. But the important question to ask is, it sounds nice, but is it true? Can it actually be true that all paths lead to God? In the book, Robinson Crusoe, Man Friday says this quote, Worship any way you like, as long as you mean it. God won't mind. And it sounds enlightening, but what if it's not true? And can it be true? If you look at the world's five main faiths or five main religions in the world, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Judaism and Hinduism, you will see that there are certain things that are similar about them. Like, for example, all of these faiths have prayer and worship. They'll have a kind of a setting like this where people are gathered. All of them have a holy book. Um, All of them share some kind of moral similarities, like do unto others as you would want done to you. But that's pretty much where the similarities stop. Most of the similarities are kind of there on the surface, but when you look deeper, they can't lead up the same mountain because they all have a fundamentally different claim about the means of salvation, about how you actually get right with God. So, for example, Christianity says, uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus claimed to be God himself. But in Islam, they say that Jesus was just a prophet and not as great a prophet as the prophet Muhammad. 
And so, therefore, how could Jesus be the way, the truth, and the life? He never died and he rose again in that belief system. In Judaism, they say that Jesus was just an an imposter, that he wasn't the Messiah at all. In Hinduism, there is the belief not just in one God, but in many gods, and that it's actually through the life that you live that will determine whether you reincarnate into a better life in the future. And so, basically, it's a system of self-salvation. You save yourself. And then in Buddhism, there's no personal God at all. It's just about reaching a new state of enlightenment. And so each of the world's five main faith systems have fundamentally different and opposed views about how you get right with God. And so they can't all lead up the same mountain. It doesn't make logical sense. But this is kind of similar to how Jethro thinks. This is kind of what is in his mindset. He recognises Yahweh and he even probably you know, offers worship to Yahweh when it's maybe convenient or prudent for him to do so. But it's unlikely at this point that he believes that Israel's God alone is the one true creator God and he alone can save. And so Jethro is a religious guy, but not in the same way that Moses is. They're different. They're from the same family, but they're not from the same spiritual family. And that can... You, you may have experienced that in your life. You may experience that, that difference of people in your own family that don't share the same faith. Sometimes that does create some tension. Or sometimes to know uh, that something is the most important thing to you, like your love of God, and to, to have somebody else who doesn't see it that way, that can sometimes be, be a challenge that we can relate to. But something is going to take place here. You see, in verse 7, it says, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and he bowed down and kissed him and they asked each other their welfare and went into the tent. They went into the tent. And it's in the tent that everything changes. Uh, Verse 8, then Moses told, or the word in Hebrew is proclaimed, so there's this idea of him proclaiming what has happened. He told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. So this was a powerful time in the tent together. Moses is just detailing it blow by blow. He's telling him everything that had happened along the way. And have a look at Jethro's response. He says, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. He is thrilled for Moses. And this can be true in a lot of people that you come across. A lot of people can be happy that you found God. Because if that makes your life better, then they're happy that that faith in God works for you. But, you know, we'll leave it there. But for Jethro, this becomes a a personal reality for himself. Have a listen to his confession. This is the, the high point of the whole text. He says this, Now I know, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Now I know. What is that? That's a statement of conversion. That's a statement of, I once was blind, but now I see. And this this is what's going on here. This This is more than your average family reunion. This is someone from a foreign land, from a foreign nation, being powerfully brought in to God's spiritual family. They're coming in now to the same family. And this is no mistake to the book of Exodus. All right, You might think, whoa, you know, isn't God just all about the Jews, about Israel? This is no mistake to the book of Exodus. This has been God's plan from the beginning. If you were, if you were with us, if you're, perhaps you're familiar with the book of Exodus, you see that the way the book actually begins is with no one knowing God and Pharaoh not knowing Joseph, and Pharaoh not knowing Joseph's God. And then you have a people who are suffering, who are wondering, has our God forgotten us? And so they don't really know whether he's present with them. And then in in Exodus 6, God says to Moses, this is, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And then it's repeated, Exodus 7, 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Exodus 10, and you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson what I have done, that you may know the Lord. And in Exodus 14, 4, right at the powerful moment of the Red Sea, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. What has God wanted from the beginning? He has wanted to make himself known. He has wanted to become known throughout all the world. And it's not just for the people of God, not just for Israel, 
but for the whole world. And that is making good on the promise to Abraham that through your family, through this family, the whole world will be blessed. And that's what's happening here. You have a foreign uh, man, a, a priest of Midian, a religious guy who's servant to, to other gods, false gods in the world, who now comes in and is now welcomed into the family, the same family that Moses belongs to as one of the people of God. Yes, he's his father-in-law, but he is the priest of Midian. And this shows us God's heart to reach people that they may confess with their mouth, now I know that the Lord, that Yahweh, is greater than all other gods. Now, think about this. What happened in that tent? What happened in that tent to bring about a proclamation, a confession like that from Jethro? Now, I think what Moses did here was what the Apostle Paul later says in Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. There, the gospel, the good news about what God has done is a power. It's not just a set of words. It's not just a philosophy. It's not just an idea. It's a power. There's power in it. When it's proclaimed, it can actually bring about a confession. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. And this is what the role of a prophet was. This is what Moses' role was. He's fulfilling his role. He may not have known it. But at this point, he's fulfilling his role as a prophet to bear witness to what God has done, all the great things that he has done. And I think it's actually good to have a look at what, what, what are some of the features of what he said in that tent that are actually helpful for us in our witness as we bear witness and, and we testify to what God has done. The first thing I think we do is we, we see the power in the testimony. The first thing we see is that Jethro was well respected. Did you notice as Emily read out the text, that as Jethro came, he sent out word to Moses. And Moses is a big shot leader. He's, a big, he's leading two million people. He led people through the Red Sea. But he rolls out the red carpet for his father-in-law. He goes out to greet him and kiss him, and he bows down before him. He shows him the hospitality that his father-in-law deserves. He respects his father-in-law. And I think this is so important for us as we give testimony to what our God does. Does our life actually line up like that? Do we respect people, even people that don't share the same belief as us? Sometimes we reserve our greatest warmth and our greatest affection and our greatest love for other believers. But we don't extend it in the same way to people who don't share the same faith, who don't believe. And so how can we ever have any power in our testimony if we don't demonstrate that heart of love, if we don't demonstrate that heart of respect, even to the people who you know, don't line up with your values, who have sinned in ways that you kind of you know, find repulsive or live a lifestyle that you find repulsive? You know, our, our call as Christians is to demonstrate the love of God to all people, no matter who they are. We must demonstrate that heart of love and respect, otherwise there's no power in our testimony. And so Jethro is well respected. The second thing we see about the testimony is that this is a God-centered testimony. Notice in verse 1 and verse 8, Moses declares all the things that the Lord has done. Now, he could have said a lot of great things, like, did you see me when I held the staff up? Did you see me how good I was? But no, that's not his testimony. I mean, the testimony is what the Lord has done among them. The Lord parted the Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground and all they pretty much did on the other side was grumble and complain when they didn't have water and food. This was all about what God has done and that is what the good news of the gospel is. The good news is not about, it's not about us. It's not about what I have or what I haven't done. It's about what God has done in Jesus Christ for me and for you in our place. This is actually one of the most, uh, it's one of the most awesome things to consider. Any time that you're struggling with shame or guilt, grief, any kind of you know, feeling of disconnect between you and God, we don't look to ourselves. We don't look and say, here's what I have to offer. We, we actually look at what God has done for us in Christ. In 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 5, Paul says, I will, boast, I will not boast about myself, except maybe about my weaknesses. That's where my boast is. 
but I won't boast about myself. In Galatians 6.14, he says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where it was all done. And so our testimony doesn't have to be gory to be powerful. It just has to bear witness to what God has done. The gospel is a power. It has the ability to save as it is being said, as it is being spoken. You know, even the famous evangelist and preacher, Billy Graham, had to learn this. Uh, that he tells a story or told a story of in 1955, he went to Cambridge University and he, he went there, he was giving a series of talks night after night. And because it was quite an educated um, academic crowd, he decided to put on a little bit of, you know, just, you know, kind of juice up his talks a little bit, give him a bit more intellectual, give him a little bit more stuff that might impress them and wow them. And he said for three nights, night after night, nothing happened. Nothing happened. No one responded. And so he chucked all of that out. And the fourth night, he just preached Jesus and him crucified. And hundreds of people came to Christ. And for him, that was this great lesson. You know what? You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be very fancy. You don't have to give, a, give you know, reasons for every little thing and tick every little box. You just have to present Christ and what he's done. And there's power in that to save. So this is powerful because it's a God-centered testimony. Thirdly, and importantly, this is a historically grounded testimony. Uh, Moses is discussing with Jethro actual events, actual things that happened. All that the Lord has done is said multiple uh, times. And in detail, what he is talking about he's, is he's talking about the actual slavery in Egypt. He's talking about the plagues. He's talking about the Passover. He's talking about the Red Sea, about the cloud by day and the fire by night that led them through the wilderness, about the great victory over the Amalekites. He's telling them, him, about actual events that happened. And they're events that Jethro looked upon and he believed on the basis of those historical events. Now, we also do this very same thing. We look upon events that have happened in history and we believe. And so unlike un other religions, Christianity is not a philosophy. It's not a philosophy. It's not a system of ideas or way of thinking. It's not, uh, you know, uh, to work out what Christianity is. You ponder for a while and you look up to the stars and you get it or you look within and you get it. That's not how Christianity works. Christianity is built on historical events, things that have actually uh, happened. And that was actually the whole purpose of Luke writing his biography of Jesus, writing his gospel. That's, that was his particular intent in writing that gospel. And he opens it like this. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write down an orderly account for you, that you may have certainty, that you may be sure, that you may know concerning the things that you have been taught. And so Luke goes on to detail what those historical events actually were, that Jesus was the completion of a whole bunch of prophecies that took place, that he was the one true eternal God, the second person of the Trinity, who came and lived a sinless life, who lived and died under Pontius Pilate, who rose again and his disciples bore witness to his rising. And they actually went about proclaiming this good news and each of them were martyred for it. Each of them died for it. This is what Luke goes on and details for us because our faith is historically grounded. It's not a philosophy or a system of ideas. And this is why Jethro rejoices. He, Jeth he rejoices because he sees that this salvation that God did for the people of Israel was rooted in actual events. This is so important for us uh, when we are in that battle of feeling of worthlessness or not being good enough for God or anything like that. We don't actually rest on how we feel. We rest on what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross for us, where he rose again. And that totally frees you. I want, to, I want you to hear that in your hearing this morning. That totally frees you from thinking that it's anything about you or the way that you feel today, about whether you feel right with God. How do I get that assurance? How do I recover that assurance again in my life? I look back upon that event, that day that Jesus went to the cross for me and he conquered sin and death. And that's where my faith rests. Even if the faith is small, it rests in a big work that is rooted in history. Uh, the fourth thing is that this testimony is not a sugar-coated testimony. Did you notice in the text that 
that Moses told Jethro all the hardship. It says all the hardship that had come upon them and the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And so Moses didn't kind of sugarcoat it and say, you know, come to, you know, believe in God and you'll, you'll be healthy, wealthy and wise. He didn't say that. He gave him a warts and all account of what had happened. And that actually was even more powerful because each time God had delivered them in the midst of that. And so there's power in a testimony that isn't just like, yeah, it's being a Christian is just like straightforward. You just accept these set of beliefs, done, go on with your life. It's actually by saying, you know what? There is a struggle that goes on. There is, it's, it's through many trials and tribulations that we'll see the kingdom of God. It's going, to be, it's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. It's going to clash with my flesh at times. There's going to be things that happen to me that I don't understand why they're happening. God, why is this happening to you? But in the midst of that, God proves himself faithful. And millions of Christians, billions of Christians for 2,000 years have had that same witness, that same testimony. God delivers. God comes through. And so it's not a sugar-coated testimony. And lastly, and I think this is so important, is that Moses is personally affected. He's personally affected by what God has done. This isn't a cold transfer of information. This isn't just like, you know, uh, just an intellectual discussion. This isn't a theological discussion. This is Moses personally affected by it. And I think we need to be challenged about that as Christians. Are we still personally affected by what God has done? Or has it turned into like this kind of theological tribalism and just intellectual ideas and it's like, that's wrong and that's right. Are we still personally affected by the great things that God has done? Because that's where power comes in the testimony. When you have the truth, but the truth isn't out here, it's actually personally infected you. And that's how it becomes this powerful testimony. And, and it's really um, you know, obvious in Moses' life in the naming of his sons. You look at the transformation that has happened to him. His first son is called Gershon, which means, oh, I was a stranger in a foreign land. That happened at the time of his life where he failed in Egypt to deliver. He murdered an Egyptian, had to flee, and life just looked terrible. And so he called his son, I'm a stranger. But then God had delivered them, and we get the name of his second son, Eliezer. The God of my father has been my help. And his whole life is defined by that salvation. Now, I wonder, if, is that true for you? Is your whole life defined by the great work of what Christ has done in your life? I was blind, but now I see. And that still sings in my heart. You, 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 you could say with the psalmist, my mouth will tell of the righteous deeds of God, of the deeds of salvation all the day. Or come and hear all you who fear God and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. Just what God has done for my soul. Are you still personally affected by what God has done for you? This was no ordinary or just biological family reunion. This was God opening up his family to the priest of Midian, to the nations. This was God opening up his family to the whole world. And God is still adding to his family. God is still adding to his, fa his family daily, weekly, people all over the world who are coming and joining his family because of the work of Jesus Christ. I want to invite the team to come up and lead us in a song. But I want to ask you a couple of questions this morning. And the first one is this. Do you have a testimony like Moses? Do you have a testimony like Moses, one where there's people in your life who need to come to know Jesus that know your respect? They know your respect. You respect them. They know your love. Where it's a God-centered testimony, it's not about you, but you have an ongoing witness about what God has done. Where it is grounded in history, where it's not sugar-coated and where you're still personally affected by that. Maybe that's not been forefront of your mind. But I want to encourage you to recover a testimony like Moses because it is the power of God unto salvation. It is how God is adding to his family. So maybe this morning you need to say, Lord, revive my heart for what you have done for me. 
make that sing again in my heart. I want to ask you this morning, who do you need to bring into the tent? Who do you need to bring into the tent and have that conversation with about what God has done? You know, I know that many of you this morning, as, as myself, you know, you've got family in your life that you love, but they aren't spiritual family. And you long for them to become spiritual family. Your, your heart's cried out for that, but you're not really sure how that might happen. Perhaps you're struggling really to know what to do. I just want to ask you this morning, just with every, every head bowed and eyes closed, if there's just somebody in your family, your biological family, someone that you love, that just comes to your heart and mind right now, just maybe if you might raise your hand and I'd love to pray for you and I'd love to pray for your family. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. There's a lot of hands up today. I know this is such a huge thing. People have a heart for their family. You want to see the thing that's most important to you become most important to them. For God's glory, for their joy, for your joy. Oh, Lord, we just we stand here and we ask in faith for you to do great work in our families. Lord, we, we're, not, we're not very clever. We're not very smart. And we know... Uh, Lord, that there can be all kinds of hindrances and awkwardness and, and things get, that get in the way. But we just ask, Lord, that you, with your great love and mercy and the incredible work that you've done for us, I pray that you might just cross those boundaries and, and soften hearts, Lord, and bring about salvation in our families, we pray. Lord, encourage each heart today. Encourage each person. Lord, maybe there's something that we, you're calling us to do. Something to recover in our own testimony and witness. In our own courage. Lord, I, I pray for a spirit of courage to come across your people today. And also a spirit of love. That we would be the most hospitable, loving, welcoming people. That would be known for that, Lord. So, Lord, do a work in our families, I pray. All those names and all those faces that just came to mind, Lord, we ask for great work to be done in their hearts and lives. In Jesus' name. I want to ask you another question for some others this morning, just with every head bowed. I've asked, do you have a testimony of like Moses? But the other side is, is do you have a confession like Jethro's, where you know in your heart of hearts... And there's this, there's this witness in your own heart. Now I know. Now I know that Jesus is greater than all others, that Jesus is greater than all other things. Do you know that with full assurance this morning? You know, that kind of testimony is one that's like saying, I was blind, but now I see. It's like saying, I was blind to sin and I didn't really think sin was that significant. In fact, I didn't really understand what sin was. But I do understand that I've fallen short of God's glory, that I'm in need of a saviour. And now I see that. Perhaps God's even just speaking to you now. Now I see that. I'm in need of a saviour. I didn't see what the whole big deal about Jesus was, but now I see that he has come and he's died in my place. And there's something that's speaking, God's speaking to your heart this morning about that. There's nothing that you have to do. There's, there's no works that you have to perform. There's no religious kind of things that you have to do at all, but simply to believe in his work for you. So this morning, without anyone else looking around, no one else is looking around, just me this morning, if, if anyone wants to just make that commitment, if you might just raise your hand this morning to say, yes, I, I want to believe in Jesus. For the first time, I'm putting my faith and my trust in him. Is there anyone this morning that might just raise their hand? Father God, I, I thank you for the testimony that, and the, the, the internal witness of the Holy Spirit that is in this room and the hearts of your people today. 
I thank you that we know that you are greater. We know with full assurance what you've done for us. I praise you for that. Lord, I just pray for anyone who's going through a season of doubt right now. Maybe they're questioning things. Things are going through their mind or they're wondering, has everything I've been taught, is that real? Or perhaps they're feeling distant from you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we might come back to that, that faith that is grounded in the truth. That we might, there might be just waves of assurance that come across people's heart. That all doubt, Lord, would, would fade away. That we'd be people who are convinced of what you've done for us. And so, Lord, would you, would you do that among us by your grace and your mercy? Lord, I praise you and worship you. We thank you for meeting with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.